has a point that you said it orally rather more clearly than your predecessor said it in paragraph 30 of paragraph 2. It's often the way when staring at um, three judges of your seniority, but yes, I mean, I put it my way. And I don't think I've altered the substance of what is said in paragraph 32. It is said that, that my clients cannot or could not be heard to say that. If that necessitates an amendment to the pleading, if you were to allow this appeal, then that's an amendment to the pleading. At the moment, that pleading's gone, if I can put it like that. It's been struck out. So, so where this is said below, as I understand it, um, doesn't stand at the moment, and that's before um, my laws at the moment. The next thing I wanted to show you is in core bundle tab four. And this is the last point on, on parameters, as it were, which we're just um, getting clarity on before I proceed. This is the part the PD52C, paragraph 19, notice of objections to the granting of permission to appeal. This is a document that was before my Lord, Lord Justice Mails at the time he granted permission on the papers in this matter in April of this year. Can I just ask my Lords to go to paragraph 5.3? And it's the second sentence. And, and this is an important point, uh, because what I, what I discern from the supplemental skeleton received yesterday morning from the respondents is an attempt to shift off the position which has always been the case, and which in my submission has to be the case once we look at the arbitral materials, which is that the rescission in this case that they rely on in these proceedings took place pursuant to a decree by the tribunal. There has never been, and I'll be very clear about this, there has never been any rescission by election in this case. Whether by express election, a Vale saying, I rescind, or whether by implied election, Vale starting an arbitration on a basis that is inconsistent with the continuation of the contract. There is now an attempt, as I understand it, or as I read it or perceive it, to bring in election, rescission by election. This is not a case of rescission by election. And when we look at the arbitral materials, you'll see that that case is closed. And if you, did, if you wanted the clearest example of seeing how that case is shut off, it's the second sentence of that notice of objection. Rescission, inequity, pursuant to the award. That's what we're dealing with. Um, whilst we're in this short document, um, I would draw my Lord's attention to paragraph two. The final sentence. And paragraph 5.1. Hold on, you can't read the last sentence without reading the first ones. Oh, I do apologise. So you see the point there taken that the award can't benefit my clients. And then in 5.1, over the page, same point again, saying that the judge was right, because the judge's core reasoning, however brief it may be, was that the award can't help my clients. Um, um, I will say this as a forensic uh, observation. If the case of Sun Life was a complete shutout to my position on this appeal, I would have expected my learned friends to have cited it before it was brought to their attention last Friday. Point one, and I would have expected, with the greatest respect, my, my, learned, my Lord, Lord Justice Males, to have refused permission. Because uh, my Lord, Lord Justice Males, when considering the papers, saw this document, saw the judgment below, which was all about said to be a shutout point on the binding effect of awards, and with Sun Life, no doubt, in his mind, would have refused permission. I say that only with the greatest respect and as a forensic observation. Sun Life is not a shutout. We're here now to discuss Sun Life, and I'll do that in due course. Well, with whatever um, respect you said, I'm afraid you can't draw any conclusions about whether I had Sun Life in mind at the time of granting permission to appeal, or indeed whether I would have granted permission to appeal if I had. I say no more than that, my <coughs> but, but, uh, but it's now obviously something which um, features heavily in the analysis, and it will be dealt with in due course. Um, then heading number one, background. Can I ask you to take up the court, the supplemental bundle, I should say?
and tab one. And this is the request for arbitration. And as the court will know, this is a, the arbitral claimant was Vale SA, the first claimant in these proceedings, and one of the respondents before you, and the respondent was what we're calling BSGR. That's a subsidiary of one of my clients, or the, and the indirect subsidiary of the uh, other of my clients, if I can put it like that. Um, the request for arbitration obviously frames uh, the outer limits of arbitral jurisdiction, subject to any amendments or waivers which occur down the line to expand or modify arbitral jurisdiction. So this sets the parameters of the arbitrator's substantive jurisdiction. Um, you will find nowhere in it any reference to an election to rescind, either an express election to rescind, or of the declaration that this document, by commencing arbitration, constitutes uh, rescission. The only thing you will find in this document about rescission is a request that the tribunal grants it on an equitable basis. If I can ask you please to look at paragraph 15 on page 8. Final sentence says Vale thus seeks return of the money that BSGR fraudulently obtained. Then you read through to the comma, rescission of its agreements with BSGR, and if to the extent necessary, a declaration of the agreements have been frustrated. Obviously, frustration and rescission don't sit hand in hand um, necessarily. There are different ways of bringing about the end of a contract. But there we are. No reference to an election. If you go through, please, to paragraph 42. You see that again, entitlement to rescission and damages based on reliance interest. You then see that's all under the heading of Roman 1, which is on the previous page, fraudulent misrepresentations where inducement and fraud was first set up, and then paragraph 42 caps it off. You then have a claim for breach of warranty. You then have the claim for, uh, for frustration. Um, nowhere in the, in the request for arbitration was there a self-standing claim for personal restitution. There was a claim for rescission, and there was a claim for um, fraud damages, for deceit damages on the reliance measure. If you go to the prayer for relief, paragraph 49, you see um, the same scheme laid out. Relief for fraudulent misrepresentation. A, rescission. B, damages. Uh, which can, and the 1.25 billion obviously includes the initial consideration. I think it's called the April, the April payment. And then relief. So uh, this is an important point to bear in mind. The arbitrator's substantive jurisdiction is set and framed by this document. This document claims rescission on an equitable basis, but doesn't separately claim personal, restitu personal restitutionary liability. It only separately claims it only separately claims a remedy which is inconsistent with personal restitutionary liability. That is to say, damages for deceit. Damages for deceit are based on the claimant's loss. A personal restitutionary liability is based on the defendant's, or in this case, respondent's gain. You can't get both. You can plead both, but you can never get both, because they're, they're on an inconsistent basis. One is gain-based, the other is loss-based. What Vale's lawyers chose to do here was seek <coughs> rescission and separately compensatory damages. And we'd see that things moved on from this, but that is how they set the arbitrator's jurisdiction. If you look then, please, at tab 2, <coughs> bless you, my lord, tab 2A. 
tab 2A is a two-page extract from Vale's reply in the arbitration. If you look at the, the opening page, you should have a 58.1 as the cover page. You'll see the date is 24th of March 2016. Now, something had happened in the meantime. A year before this document went in, and um, approximately a year after the arbitration had been started, so somewhere in the midpoint in that two-year period, in March 2015, Vale and BSGR had entered into the share purchase deed. Uh, now, the share purchase deed formed a separate ground for the summary judgment, but it is not that, that dismissal of that ground is, does not form a separate ground of appeal in this court. I should say that briefly. The relevance of the share purchase deed for present purposes is that it was an agreement between the parties which forms part of the matrix against which the arbitral award forms, forms to be construed or perhaps more accurately characterised for present purposes. Um, but the effect, as we know, of that share purchase deed was that Vale handed back the shares. So it basically contractually performed an element or component of restitutio in integrum in return for one dollar. And so that that could not be said to be an affirmation of the JVA, all of the rights to pursue rescission in the arbitration were expressly carved out and preserved. What that does on any view was it, it channeled or canalized the whole of the rescission dispute into arbitration. And so far as that alters at all, position already pertaining in the arbitration. And then a year later you get the reply. Now it may be, and I'm speculating here, I wasn't involved, that as a result of the share purchase deed, the reply, or the lawyers of the um, Vale, who are, I sat behind Mr. Laney, or at least their firm, took the view that in light of the share purchase deed a year earlier, they needed to bring in a claim for personal restitutionary liability as part and parcel of the rescission claim. I don't know, I speculate. What we do have before this court are two pages of the reply that was filed a year after the SPD, the share purchase deed. I'm hoping my Lord's bundle was updated and were updated to have 58.1a put in, because paragraphs 937 and more importantly 938 are important, and especially the final sentence of 938. The SGR's restitution to Vale of the foregoing sums constitutes restitutio in integrum. Now that, if anything, gives the lie to my learned friend's analysis, if needed, uh, that the um, restitutionary aspects of rescission are consequences that are somehow extraneous to or collateral to the decree of rescission itself. Not so. What, what are the sums? Oh, the sums are all the sums uh, that are referred to all disbursements and expenditures it made under the transaction documents in the prior sentence. That includes, and I believe it's common ground, that includes the half a billion initial consideration. But what, BSG, what um, Vale as arbitral claimant was telling the tribunal and asking the tribunal to grant was equitable rescission on the basis and this is, this is key, on the basis that that involved the handing back of the half a billion as restitution. They say the handing back of that sum, as well as other sums, constitutes restitutio in integrum. It is a false analysis, it is a fallacy, to see personal restitution as a consequence of rescission, when in fact, and on proper analysis, it is a precondition to it, even if the answer is it's denied, and, it's a, and it has a nil value. And then you see over the page at 941, Vale is therefore entitled to rescind, again, they are claiming rescission, and to obtain from BSGR restitution, totaling the whole amount, including the half a billion. And then you have damages, the compensatory damages that are dealt with after that. We then get to the award in tab three, and I'm assuming my lords took the opportunity to read the, the relevant well, I've, I've taken out the, the page which has 921 and 922. Um, and if you want 
to show us other. There are there are other paragraphs that lead up to it. They were referenced in a, in a footnote in my supplemental skeleton, but I appreciate that footnotes don't always get the attention uh, that other bits do. If I can ask you to go to bundle page sixty, so it's page two five zero of the award. It's the heading rescission, point one rescission, and then general principles. If I can ask my lords to read uh, nine, sorry, eight nine six through to the end of eight nine nine, it may be the quickest way of doing it. And so what that section does, my lords have had an, an opportunity just to, um, to read through to the end of 899, is it sets up the general principles for the grant of precision. And the key phrase or section in that is the second half of 898. By contrast, equitable precision takes place by way of tribunal's order. The party would ask the tribunal to order precision, and if satisfied, the tribunal would make the necessary orders to implement precision and typically on condition the requesting party may counter restitution, etc. And then they go on to consider restitutio in integral and its possibility. And of course there was an argument in, in by BSGR in the arbitration that restitutio was impossible, uh, which was rejected. Over the page where we got to, paragraph 900, since its request for arbitration, Vale has consistently requested that the tribunal, quotes, grant rescission. And that's my point about how there is no case of election and there's no case that could tolerably be run before my lords today that there was any rescission by election here. It's always been on the basis that Vale asked the tribunal to grant it. You then get a, um, a series of paragraphs with a lot of detail and transcripts which we can mercifully flick past and go to page 65. And if you can pick it up at 9.07. The tribunal understands Vale's position to be that it is seeking equitable rescission, with the emphasis on equitable. Based on the wording of Vale's pleading, Vale has repeatedly requested the tribunal to grant, in inverted commas, rescission. And then at the end, on this footing, the tribunal will apply the principles which are applicable to equitable rescission. And those principles are then applied in 908. And if you can read 908 and 909, you can see the way the tribunal um, set itself up to go. And that it's only in light of that you then get to the conclusion section on the page that my Lord, Lord Justice Dean has extracted, uh, which is page 69. And paragraphs 921 and 922 are important. In particular, in 921 it says, in considering the orders to make to achieve restitutio in integral. So nothing about being um, consequential or extraneous. This is about what you need to do or don't need to do in order to decree rescission in this particular case. The orders to make to achieve restitutio, that's important. And then paragraph 922 obviously rehearses the four different payments 
the one that we're concerned with is number one, the initial consideration. The tribunal considers that the first three heads cannot be claimed under rescission. That's a key phrase, under rescission. And the tribunal cannot order BSGR to pay these sums to Vale as part of its rescission order. I would ask my lords to underline under and as part of, as well as to achieve in the previous paragraph. So what was being sought was personal restitution of the 500 million under rescission or as part of rescission. And that's important when you take a step back and look at the, arbitra the arbitrator's jurisdiction. As I said, the, the request for arbitration framed the jurisdiction. It did not contain, and there was no amendment or expansion of arbitral jurisdiction to bring in a separate head of relief for personal restitution. It was always claimed, the return of the 500 million was always claimed by Vale under the claim for rescission. There were two heads of claim, primarily rescission and reliance damages, compensation. There was no separate claim for restitution. It was brought under the rubric or within, under the umbrella of rescission. And that is exactly what happened, and it's exactly what the tribunal dealt with, and it's how the tribunal dealt with it in making its decree of rescission. That's all very important. That's the award. <clears throat> if we go, please, to the supplemental bundle and look at the particulars of claim. That's sort of the pool bundle. Tab. Before we leave the award, do you agree that uh, do you agree with the judge that the arbitrator's reasoning at paragraph nine two two is inconsistent with nine four four? Um, well, I do as a matter of observation. Yes. And if I, if I was the arbitrators, I don't know if I'd done the same thing. On the other hand, if I may be permitted this, if I'd been the claimant's counsel in that case, I might have run an analysis based on agency in order to get home on uh, restitution for my client, but they didn't. All right. Well, I was simply asking whether you agree that the reasoning of the award is internally inconsistent, and I think you, you I, do agree with I that. I do. The, the two, the, if I can put it like this also, the two claims were logically inconsistent. As I said, you can't claim restitution on the basis of a gain, your... your counterparty's gain, and also claim compensation on the basis of your own loss. So the tribunal had to choose between the two, uh, but I do accept, as the judge uh, was quick to point out in his judgment, that the basis for the tribunal choosing, choosing between the two um, is somewhat awkward, if I can put it like that. Um, but there was no agency analysis run, and if the agency analysis had been run, it might have been a different outcome for them. But they are now seeking through things like splitting the equity and giving the rescission trust benef benefit to Vale International, a non-party, and I seeking to get around that bad result. That's obviously what's at play here. Now, the points of claim in the litigation are tab 10 of core. And we don't need to spend an awful lot of time on this. Paragraph 11 is the plea of rescission. JVA, in circumstances in which the JVA has been rescinded by, at the latest, delivery of the award, the claimant's entitled to make a proprietary claim to traceable proceeds. So this is all part of the summary of what is, admittedly, a, um, quite a chunky pleading. So that's the summary. So has been rescinded by, at latest, delivery of the award. If you go then to 118, that's paragraph 118 on bundle page 168, you get to the section on proprietary claims, section K, and it's the first sentence. As a result of Varley's institution of arbitration proceedings and or the award, the JVA and the SHA were rescinded. Now, that's the pleading, but of course, we all know that the words before and or are unsustainable because there was never, it was never said in the arbitration uh, that by starting the arbitration, the contracts had been rescinded. It was only ever said in the arbitration that they were seeking rescission from the tribunal. That was crystal clear. So yes, it is pleaded that way. And my learned friend, no doubt, um, she does in fact quote that in her supplemental skeleton. But it doesn't make it a sustainable position. It is not. It is not a sustainable position. In this case, 
a rescission was granted pursuant to an arbitral decree, a decree of rescission in an arbitral award. There is the defence to that section in paragraph 72 to 76 of the defence in the next tab. I don't need to show you that. I don't think anything turns on it. There's lots of criticisms of it, what it contains and what it doesn't contain. But that's by the by. If I can ask you to go to the reply in the litigation, tab 12. It's a composite reply to the different defences put in by the different defendants, and it's, you've only got the section on proprietary claims. And that starts at page 224. Paragraph 110. It is denied that Vale has not, and it says, and or now cannot rescind the JVA. Once again, there's a vice, a vice here with, with the phrase and or. In my submission, the words after and or are unsustainable. Uh, because Vale's position is that the um, rescission was ordered by the tribunal in its award. So the concept of rescinding in the future at that point in time in the reply makes no sense. Over the page 110.4, The award records that the tribunal hereby rescinds the contracts on account of fraud and misrepresentation. The JVA and the SHA have accordingly been rescinded. So there is the, it's a clear invocation in the pleading of rescission through the award. And over the page, last reference, 110.5, which contains um, three Roman numeral denials. Roman numeral one, you see the and or point that we saw in paragraph 118 of the, of the particulars of claim. And you know my submission on that, that the Vale's case is and can only be that it's the award that rescinded those contracts. Roman two is important. Vale is required to claim rescission. It's denied, rather, that Vale is required to claim rescission in these proceedings. Vale pursued and was granted rescission pursued and was granted a rescission of the JVA and SHA against its contractual counterparty in the arbitration. And then at the end, as set out above, the contracts have already been rescinded. So that's pretty clear in the pleading that rescission depends on the award and was granted by the award. Now, it occurred to me over the weekend to ask my solicitors why it was that the award was in evidence in these proceedings bearing in mind that two of the claimants in these proceedings were not a party to the arbitration, and none of the defendants in these proceedings were party to the arbitration. And I thought, well, hold on, how come we've all got these materials? How come we've got the award? And the answer was that the claimants sought and obtained a freezing order in December 2019 from I think it was, uh, Sir Michael Burton. And as part of seeking and obtaining the freezing order, they sought the court's permission to rely on the arbitral materials, including the award, in these proceedings. And the basis upon which they sought that permission was to invoke Article 30, or one of the exceptions in Article 30 of the LCI rules, which allows um, the overriding of arbitral confidentiality where it, where it is required, is the phrase, required, in order to protect legal rights, and or the common law, the recognised common law exception to arbitral confidentiality, i.e. necessity to vindicate or protect your legal rights. So the claimant's position in this litigation is that they needed the award and they needed to be able to refer to the award in order to vindicate their rights, i.e. to bring these, these proprietary claims against my clients. Now that tells you something as well. And now we can start to see why without wishing to jump ahead, this case is so very different from Sun Life. Because in our case, unlike in Sun Life, you have claimants who've come to court, only one of whom was in the arbitration. And they have sought and obtained permission to, to open up the arbitration and rely on the award. And they have pleaded rescission by reference to the award because they have no other way of showing rescission because rescission only occurred in and through the award. And it's not just that the claimants have done that against defendants who are non-parties to the arbitration. 
two of the three claimants who were non-parties to the arbitration. So the idea, when we come to Sun Life in due course, and we look at the different rationales that are put forward for protecting non-parties from the arbitration, or in that case, not allowing non-parties to take the benefit of findings in arbitration, we can see that our case is nothing like it whatsoever. In our case, you have claimants starting. Let me start again. If the model is A arbitrates against B and gets a result X, A then sues C in court, and the question, two questions can arise. Is X bound? Sorry, is C, sorry, the defendants in the court proceedings, bound by finding X or result X? in the AB arbitration. I would call that the burden scenario. The alternative scenario is A, when he, sues in, when he sues C in court proceedings, is he bound by his own finding or result X from his own prior arbitration vis-a-vis -vis C? In other words, can C take the benefit of finding X in the AB arbitration? I'd call that the benefit scenario. Ours, in our situation, we're in the latter scenario. Uh, and, and, and I would say it is utterly intolerable, and this court should not tolerate a situation in which A, well, and a friend's client, and two of its corporate uh, cousins who weren't in the arbitration, comes to court, sues a, a range of defendants, gets permission from the court to rely on the award and all the arbitral materials, pleads the award, and has to rely on the award for the central foundation proposition that the AB contract has been rescinded. We are thousands of miles away from Sun Life. And like I say, we will come to Sun Life in due course. But when you go through the various rationales of mutuality, privacy, and things like that, they just don't apply in our case. Did all three claimants make the application for disclosure of the award, or only the first claimant? Well, I've seen an extract from a skeleton argument that was on behalf of all three um, claimants, different counsel at that stage. My little friend might be able to assist. Uh, my Lord, it was for all three, but I'm told the reason for the reference to the award was to be able to use the, disclo the documents disclosed in these proceedings through the arbitral proceedings. So that was the reason for bringing in the award so that the underlying material could be relied upon. Mm. If this is an important point, as you seem to be saying um, that it is, uh, what's its current evidential statement at the moment? It's a conversation between you and your solicitors over the weekend, and we have none of the material to which you're referring. Well, um, I believe it to be common ground that an application was made by all three claimants for a worldwide freezing order in December 2019. As part of that application, they sought permission from the court. I'll be told if this is not common ground. Permission, permission from the court. Permission to do what? To get the award or the underlying documents? Or all, both? all of it. The, the award and the underlying the award and the underlying materials. Mm -hmm. uh, permission, uh, the permission was sought on the basis of Article 30 of the LCI rules, which is mm -hmm. about whether it's required to vindicate your legal rights, I'm paraphrasing, and the common law exception on whether it's necessary to protect your legal rights. Such permission was granted as part of the granting of the worldwide freezing order, and that's why we, we keep getting given... Mm -hmm. The arbitration. second and third claims can't have been trying to enforce the award because they weren't parties to it. They may have wanted to rely on parts of it because they'd established facts between the first claimant and others, and they may have wanted the documents. But you're not suggesting, are you, that they wanted to get the award because they were enforcing it in a court proceeding? What I'm, what I'm suggesting, and it flows from the state of the pleading mm -hmm. and the way the case is put, that Vale International, the third claimant, who is a stranger to the award, needs the award in order to, um, to found its rescission to get its rescission trust, so yes. And in that sense, it doesn't matter whether they applied or not, then? Well, it's icing on the cake, Yes. <laughs> if I can put it like that. Or as our American friends would say, gravy. Um, uh, we have another I intervention. Rising, but I am struggling with the amount of new material that is coming out to take instructions and to, um, to keep on top of it, because there's quite a lot of material, for example, <laughs> the other defences in the proceedings and other material that I would want to refer to that keeps on going to the market out. Yes. Well, I wasn't involved in these proceedings um, then, but there we are. Um, like I say, it's icing on the cake, and I'm glad my Lord, Lord Justice Lewis said that, because the real point is the pleading point and the juridical basis of the proprietary claim. These claimants cannot um, bring their proprietary claims against my clients 
without invoking the award, the decree of equitable rescission inside the award. They need it. That's their basis. And what we say is they can't take the rough, sorry, they, they have to take the rough with the smooth, if I can put it like that. They can't um, pick. He who lives by the award dies by the award. And, it, and, and as glib as that may sound, it actually is the nub of the point here. You can't have it both ways. And it's nothing like Sun Life. In Sun Life, the former arbitral party was a defendant's proceedings and sought to set up a defence. Um, and, and wasn't allowed um, to rely. Wasn't allowed to to um, take the benefit of it. Um, that's that's the principle, is it? Because I was wondering, um, as it well, what's the legal principle, which you say means that a non-party can take the benefit of an award. Um, you've had, as it were, your um, rant saying that it's intolerable that uh, this should happen, but. The actual legal principle, which means that it's not permitted, is is precisely what. Yeah, well, I'll take that in stages. Um, the, the forensic rant, if you want to call it that, was act, actually has a label uh, in this jurisdiction, and it's abuse of process. And we'll come to we'll come to what is said about abuse of process when I get to the law in a short while. But abuse of process hasn't been raised. It wasn't raised below. It's not a it's not a basis for this application, because this application wasn't a strikeout application. It was a summary judgment application in reverse. Um, having said all that, the, the, all courts have a constitutional responsibility to protect the abuse of their process, and it is well known that a court can take of its own initiative an abuse of process point if it thinks its process is being abused. It is said against me that abuse of process ought to be pleaded. It's not a pleading point. There's no requirement to plead abuse. We can have a separate discussion about abuse in due course, and then it may well be that... Was abuse run before the judge? It was not, no. Um, and one of the avenues open to the court on today, I don't advocate it because it's less than my primary case, is to allow this appeal to the extent of allowing all of this to go to the trial in January before the trial judge, where abusive process can be brought as part of that. Abusive process is, as Melinda Friend says in her supplemental skeleton, a highly contextual analysis. It may well be the trial judge is the best person to deal with that. But we can't be shut out from, from running a point as serious as abusive process. But for the, That's sec for the second and third claimants, they need only to establish uh, rescission, and you say they chose to do it by getting the award and the contract and the documents which you say show that uh, the attempt for personal restitution was refused, and you say that's critical. But they could have presumably proved uh, rescission by other means. I don't see how they can do that, because rescission happened in the award. This was a. This was a. This is vital um, to understand on this appeal. No, no, I do understand it. No, I know. I know what it does. <laughs> but I'm wondering whether there were other ways because you're saying because they did it this way, therefore to try and disentangle themselves from the other findings in the course of the award is an abuse. And I'm wondering whether that is the case. If in fact this is just an evidential point rather than a principal point. About the um, opening up of the material. Yes. Yes. Well, like I say, it, it probably is. It, it may well be on proper analysis. I mean, why couldn't they have a witness to saying the contract has been rescinded? No. That would be evidence, whether or not it's good enough, because you want to say that it was the uh, yeah. arbitration. But the, the fact, all that the third claimant has to prove at the moment is rescission at this point. Uh, and if he puts in a witness statement saying it's been rescinded, that would have been enough, unless somebody says, no, no, it hasn't. Well, I'm not privy to the, um, the thought process on, on their side, but they obviously felt they needed to open up the arbitral materials and invoke the award. But, but, come up, but leave aside the evidential position of how you prove it. They, they, the claim necessarily, the claim for proprietary liability on the part of my clients, the so-called rescission trust, necessarily invokes the award. It can't not. And it you say to. because they, awoke, they invoke that part of the award that says the contract is rescinded, they must necessarily yes. have to bear all the other findings. And if they don't accept that, they're abusing the process. Not, not all the other findings. Everything that falls within the ring fence of, of the decree of, res of rescission. That is your case, really, because they didn't want to rely on that sen sentence that says rescission. They are bound by everything else to do with the finding of rescission. They're bound by everything that constitutes the ratio decidendi of the decree of rescission in that award, yes. And, and that is to not the extent that it's an abusive process to try and depart from it. It is. It's an abusive process to bring a claim based on that and then to deny an essential element of it. 
and deny that you're um, that you're bound by an essential element of it. It must be. But um, but like I say, if 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 my lords are persuaded that that there's something in that, then that would motivate my lords to allow this appeal so that can be run at trial and any appeal from the trial. Again, I don't advocate that. That's not my primary position today. My primary position is you should allow this appeal and grant the summary judgment because it's legally flawed. Now, that all answers the right. At the moment, abuse of process is not a ground of appeal and not something for which you have permission. No. The, the formal status uh, is that uh, there was a summary judgment application below, which the judge rejected. Abuse of process was not taken. But um, given the conclusion he'd reached, the judge decided that uh, it was appropriate not just to dismiss the summary judgment application, but to make a declaration that the uh, award didn't afford any defence to your clients. So um, the starting point, surely, if you want to run abuse of process, is to apply to amend your notice of appeal. Um, I don't run it as a ground of appeal. I run it, I run it to, to illustrate the, um, the limits of, of sun life, and that, that leads me to answering the first part of my Lord, Lord Justice Sales's question. And that is that sun, that, that is that this um, this award and the decree of equitable rescission in this award does bind Vale and Vale International as against my clients because the, because a decree of equitable rescission is effect, effectively a unique juridical creature. Right. Well, should we go on to that? Well, I will come on to that when I when I address the law. Um, which I'm moving to now. Yes. Um, there are. I was going to cover this under five topics, some shorter or longer than the others, and I will end on Sun Life. If, so just yes. let me know where that's coming in this. The first one is to understand the nature of the inchoate equity, and if I can ask, and its contrast to a equitable interest, and if I can ask my lords to go in the authorities bundle three. Tab 32. And this is an extract from Snell's Equity. And if I can ask my lords, um, this is bundle page 1040. If I can ask my lords to read paragraph 2. Zero zero six. First of all, And then the first um, six lines or so of 2007, just over the page where it says shows in action. Is doing there is it's trying to explain the concept of the mere equity, the thing that I described uh, earlier this morning as the, as the caterpillar, as it were, to the butterfly, which is the equitable interest. And there are contrasts between the two, and the mere equity sometimes described as proprietary power. Now, um, it is of course axiomatic that given that an equitable interest yields to equity's darling, the bona fide purchaser without notice, uh, it must follow that a mere equity also yields to equity's darling um, by definition and I don't believe that to be controversial and that obviously matters when you have a chain situation uh, that we'll look at in due course if you go please to Goffin Jones so tab 30 of the same bundle we have a large chunk of chapter 40 set out if you could go please to 40 
dash 25, bundle page 1036. You see a discussion there of the mere equity. You pick it up halfway down with the word however. I can ask my lords to read um, from however down to the bottom. Sorry, which page? A bundle page 1036. Thank you. So those two references I've, I've given you from the leading texts are really just to set up the concept, as it were, of the inchoate equity and how it contrasts with, or indeed is similar to, an, a full-blown equitable interest. The equitable interest in, in a rescission case cannot arise before rescission. The equitable interest, if it arises at all, only arises through the legal act of rescission. Now that can be by election. Um, by express or implied election, as then confirmed by a subsequent court or arbitral declaration, for example. But in this case, it wasn't. It, this, in this case, it arose only through Vale seeking and obtaining a decree of equitable decision. At that point, at that legal moment, or upon that legal event, the equity vanishes. And it either vanishes for all time, if rescission is refused, or, in our case, if rescission is granted, but personal restitution in relation to the relevant um, sum is denied, in both of those events, the equity vanishes for all time. It's gone forever. It cannot revive, and it cannot be used as against remote recipients, even if tracing were otherwise achievable. If, on the other hand, rescission is granted, the equity matures, or metamorphoses, into an equitable interest, and that is the equitable trust. The uh, misrepresentor, who is a contracting party, is instantly, in that moment, constituted as a constructive trustee. To the extent of his personal restitutionary liability, and we'll come on to that point in a moment, and the representee, who paid over the money or transferred the benefit pursuant to the void, voidable and now rescinded contract, becomes... So I understand, there's no authority that runs the two together, I can understand if the mere equity is not recognised, then no equitable interest has arisen. But once rescission is granted, it is your submission at the moment, is it, that that necessarily means if it's granted, but on terms which doesn't give restitutory rewards, but only gives uh, damages for deceit, that has the same effect as a refusal to recognise the equity in the first place. It has the same effect. And you say you can't separate it out and say... Stage one, mere equity. Stage two, granted extra interest. Stage three, as against this party, have I been able in this arbitration to enforce um, the extra interest that I want to enforce? Yeah, you say I, that's I, not the way it I works. Say, I say you don't separate it into stages like that. This comes Do you have any authority for that? Um, well, I'm going to look in a moment at the authorities on what, oh, is, okay. what is rescission right. and the fact that restitutio in the integrum is a component and precondition to rescission. And this is my point about ring fencing. You have to identify what the, the ring fenced decree of equitable rescission is. But, it, but I don't understand it to be um, controversial between us that the equity could not be, um, spent, become spent, or rather put it like this. The fate of the equity can only be determined by the decree of rescission, by the act of rescission. It can't not before and not in any other way. You need to have rescission for that equity for something to happen to the equity. It either dies for all time and is extinguished with no consequences, or it is converted into an equitable interest. But that only happens through the legal act of rescission. So the question is, against whom then can you enforce the equitable interest? Well, that, that's, that's and why we're here. you say you can't here. enforce it against number one, you can never ever have anything yes. against two, three, and four. Absolutely. And that's what I want to know, whether you were stating that so confidently, whether that is something we all ought to have learnt in law school, or whether in fact it's your submission as that, to how that, the law ought to be. That's all I was wondering. Uh, um, well, my lord is, is obviously right to wonder about that. The, um, that is the second of our two substantive propositions, which are dealt with in the, both the skeleton and the supplemental skeleton. I'm going to come to that shortly, and I'll deal with that when I do. But you're quite right. And, and it comes back to what I said in terms of fundamental principles when we started to look at the law. 
um, if an equitable interest yields to equity's darling uh, or is vulnerable to being extinguished going through a chain of, of recipients, so too must the equity before, okay. before rescission happens to crystallize it into an equitable interest. And you're quite right. If, um, if so, and so what we say quite simply is if, you never, if you're never able to crystallize that equity into an equitable interest against B, your counterparty, it must follow as a matter of law that you can never assert a proprietary restitutionary claim against subsequent recipients, C, D, E, or whoever, because it's cut off at the root. The judge called this, in dialogue with my learned friend, the foundational equity, and it's, it's a, a useful phrase. Everything stems from it. I think Mr. Stanley below had a metaphor of a tree, and he said, well, if it's cut at, if it's cut at the roots or cut at the base, none of, the, none of those branches will ever um, exist or have life, and that is, that is how it works. It must do on basic principles. So the nature of equitable rescission, um, Spence and Crawford. But is, this, is this a one-way process or two-way? Suppose, suppose the arbitrators get the facts completely wrong and say that um, there is fraud and there is entitlement to rescission um, and, and that there is a remedy uh, against the immediate contracting party who's got to restore the benefit. Um, does that bind transferees? Well, um, in so far as A, in, in this, so A is now the benefit of a finding, has the benefit of a finding in the arbitration that yeah. the contract is rescinded yes. as a DB and B is liable to him in personal restitution. A, yeah. A would then seek to, um, to, to rely on that um, against the world. Yes, he would invoke the award. So but, but, but C can say, well, why should I be bound by the findings of these arbitrators who've um, made, a, made a complete mess of the facts? Look, look at the evidence. There's no question of any fraud here. Well, that's the, that's the mutuality point that flows from equi a decree of equitable decision. So, so C is in trouble. If he, he is bound by, by the award of arbitrators who he's never agreed to be bound by, um, who've made major errors of fact and or law, and there's nothing you can do about it. Well, we have to be careful. Um, um, whether C or any non-party is bound by an arbitral award between A and B is, a, is, in my submission, a completely different inquiry as to whether A, or indeed B, who are parties to the arbitration, can assert, can take the benefit. Sorry, whether they are bound, whether A or B is bound vis-a-vis non-party. In, in my submission, when we come to look at Ward and Savile, Court of Appeal decision from earlier this year, um, one sees that this whole area of law is premised in natural justice, and it offends, it offends basic concepts of natural justice to stick a non-party, if I can put it like that, or bind a non-party with a finding from a legal process to which he wasn't a party and was not invited to join in, on the one hand, in a way that where those basic notions are not offended, where you make a party to the earlier process, A or B, um, stick with the burden of, of their own process vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. There's, a, there's, a, there's a, a glaring asymmetry between those two scenarios, which when you then come to look at Sun Life and the fact that everything said in Sun Life on this was over to anyway, you start, to, and then you look at our case where the invocation of the award, you start to see that our case is nothing like Sun Life. Um, can I go to Spence and Crawford, my lord? Well, I think your, an your answer is sure what your answer to my question is. Is, is it a one-way process or is it a two-way process? Well, my answer to my Lord's question is, if the question is, um, must A take the burden of that rescission finding? That might be one thing. If the question is, must C, as the non-party, take the burden of that rescission finding? That is another thing. Your case really depends upon the thing having been uh, stifled at birth. Yes, cut, really. at the, cut at the roots. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the foundation. It, was born, it existed briefly between the first sentence of the dispositif and the second sentence, and then was cruelly uh, dashed in the second sentence. Well, um, I, I won't engage on whether it was cruel or otherwise. It, um, the case That's what you say, is that it died yeah. almost the moment it was born. Well, it came out of its pupa, as you put it, but it never flew. There's, no, there's actually no gap um, in the sense that a mere equity is an inchoate thing. It's a proprietary power. Yes, we're not on that, though. It's been born. It did get rescinded. And therefore, something happened in your say, but it doesn't matter because it's not just the act of rescission. It's all the consequential ring fence, as you call it, 
items as to what remedies flow from that. And you say they're not remedies, they're part of the definition of the right. Well, I That's I, your case, I think, isn't it? Well, my case, just to be very clear, is that that mere equity is there from the moment the contract, a viciable, avoidable contract, is entered into. So if you have a contract between A and B procured by fraud, the equity arises upon conclusion of the contract because that contract is avoidable. That's what the equity is. Yeah, but we're looking at what happens after rescission, Absolutely. and rescission has happened. You yes. cannot avoid the fact that rescission has happened, no. and that would normally give rise to an equitable interest. Mm. And the reason why you're saying it doesn't give rise to an equitable interest is that it is briefly born but stifled because all the other findings about you can't get restitution because it was a third party who paid it, and you can only get damages for deceit, that means that the equity, which is given life in your dramatic language, ceased to have life for very much longer. Yeah, I mean, I hesitate about using um, metaphors about birth, but I, I introduced this as my caterpillar, so, so I'll mm. engage with it. And my submission, my lord, it, there was never any brief birth. Um, and we have, to, we have to be very clear about this. The equity arises upon conclusion of a, of a viciable, avoidable contract. Because the equity is the, effectively the power to rescind. Or the yeah, we're talking about the equitable interest that arises on yes, decision. Yes, I'm doing it in <laughs> stages, my lord. Um, that equity, the fate of that equity, is decided in a single legal moment, yes, which is rescission. And in this case, it transferred into an equitable interest um, because it was rescinded. No, in this case, it never transferred into an equitable interest. In other cases, it would. But in this case, it didn't, because a necessary component of the decree of rescission was the denial of personal restitutionary liability on the part of B. And if you don't have personal restitutionary liability, you can't have proprietary restitutionary liability because it's parasitic. So, so, so this other, equity... Say it hadn't just been the 500 million. Say there'd been other amounts of money paid under the contract. That would have been able to go back, wouldn't it? So there would have been an equitable interest. You're not talking about whether or not there's an equitable interest, actually. You are talking about the terms or the consequences flowing from the crystallization process on declaring it rescinded. Well, if, you, if you were to chop up, if you were to chop up the case to make it more um, to, to more elaborate, then you might get into that scenario. But let's not forget equitable interests attached to property. So if if three things had been transferred, or three separate chunks of money, let's just say, and let's be taking on board the cash fiction, then it is possible that in within that legal act that equitable, that decree of equitable rescission, you might have a finding of personal restitutionary liability on the part of B for, for asset X, but not asset Y or Z, and in which case the equity that was always there from conclusion of the contract crystallizes and give rise to an equitable interest in relation to asset X or its traceable proceeds, but not in relation, not ever, and that's, the, and that's the key word, not, yeah, not ever, ever in anybody's hands in relation to Y or Z. So you could have a, a protanto case. We don't have that here. There no, were, there were... I understand it. Yeah. So, so that is vital. So there's never a birth. Um, and I, like I say, skirting around um, birth metaphors, there's never a moment at which the equitable interest um, peaks, peaks its head over the uh, and vanishes. There's never an equitable vanishes. interest in the £500 million, pounds, yep. is what you say. Yeah, it's, it's, so in other words, the caterpillar never emerges from its chrysalis. And, and the, equi the foundational equity, as the judge called it, is extinguished, and it is extinguished for all time and against all parties, even if they have traceable proceeds in their hands and even if they are not themselves equities, darling. And it flows from the simple fact that that equity, the fate, the legal fate of that equity is set for all time. It's a legal fact, and it binds other people, That's you say. Fact. Yeah. Well, it, no, it binds A. Because it, it was A's yeah. equity in the exactly, first place. Yes. Yeah. It's a legal fact that there was no there was no equitable interest in that property. Yeah. Yes. So it, it, it starts out life as A's equity. It's only ever A's equity, and it never becomes an equitable interest in anything. And if ne A never had an equitable interest um, in anything held by B, then A can never have an equitable interest in anything held by C or D. That's that's the case yeah. in a Sorry. nutshell. Um, so the nature of equitable rescission, Spence and Crawford, I'm conscious of time. Um, that is the bundle authorities tab one. It's a well-known House of Lords decision, obviously, from 1939. I'm relying on it for a proposition about the nature of the court's grant of rescission, but 
just so my lords have the facts in mind, if not already, the vendor of shares um, sought rescission. Um, it's observed by Lord Wright that so often it's the buyer who rescinds um, and wants his money back. But in this case, the vendor rescinded and wanted his shares back. And therefore, the dispute was, well, can you have restitutio in integrum? Because things have happened to the shares in the meantime, dividends and other rights attaching and hanging off shares. Answer, yes, you can. And this is the, the big case that obviously sells that says rescission in equity is about doing substantial restitutio, if I can put it like that. Bundle page 18, 1 8. And in the report, that's 2 8 8. And if I can invite my lords to read between B and C on the, from, on the basis that the fraud is established, down to the word phrase particular case. And so the key words I rely on is it, it, that is to say the decree of equitable rescission, must be moulded in accordance with the exigencies of the particular case. That's precisely what this tribunal did. This tribunal was asked to grant rescission, and it was asked to grant rescission on the basis of the return of the 500 million. It said you have no, um, there is no liability to return the 500 million, and on that basis we grant rescission. Because it, it was said by Vale to constitute restitutio in integrum. I showed you the paragraph in their reply where they said that claim constituted restitutio in integrum. And the tribunal themselves dealt with it under and as part of rescission. Full stop. If my lords uh, leave that case and go to independent trustee services in authorities bundle tab 2, Volume 2, tab 20. Now, um, brief facts. This is a case in which a husband who was, a, who, was found to, who was a former trustee of certain investment assets and who had been operating in breach of trust, they were pension, pension scheme assets, I believe, he was accused to have breached um, that trust whilst trustee of the pension scheme. But pursuant to a, a divorce court order, a divorce order of the court, he had transferred certain assets to his wife. And the question, and then that order of the, that matrimonial order or divorce order had been set aside. And the question was, was, what was the status of those assets in the hands of the wife? So it's a case that's analogous to rescission, but it isn't about rescission of a contract. And you see that um, appearing in paragraph 52 of Lord Justice Patton's judgment on bundle page 731. And it's paragraph 52. Mr. Twigger likens the position to one involving a subsequent failure of consideration, but that is not, in my view, the right analogy. So far as any contractual analogy is appropriate, the most relevant one is the decision of the contract of sale for fraud. So the court order was analogised as a um, contract of sale, but it's an analogy. And if you then look at paragraph 53, rescission avoids the contract ab initio in relation to assets transferred to the representor. The better view, citing Mr Justice Reimer as he then was in Shalson and Russo, is that title revests in the representee. Now obviously for ground two, on this appeal, I would um, ask my lords to underline in the representee, because it, it shows that the, the inchoate equity can only ever belong to the representee, the contracting party. And if and when that inchoate equity is crystallized into or matures into an equitable interest upon rescission, if that is the case, then the equitable interest can only ever belong to the representee qua contracting party. And that is our answer. In a, in a very short nutshell, a very small nutshell, to ground two, that it's impossible, legally impossible, for Vale International um, to have an equitable interest in any of these uh, presumed, presumptively traceable proceeds. 
Why? Because it never held a foundational equity and therefore could never acquire an equitable interest. It's a real simple, it's very simple. The, ju the judge didn't, in the end, choose to decide it, as we know. Um, um, but that's not the point we're on at the moment. I'm just, asking, I'm just taking that point in whilst we're there. So it revests in the representee retrospectively once the election to rescind of the contract is made. Obviously, that's contemplating an election case, which isn't ours. Citation from Twin Sectra, Court of Appeal. If you look at F and G on this page, and just um, note the phrase, the result so far as third parties are concerned is that before rescission, the owner has no proprietary interest in the original property. All that he has is his mere equity of his right to set aside the voidable contract. That equity binds volunteers and those taking without notice, but not purchases the value. That's the um, point I made at the outset of this legal section. Then there's the citation from Lord Mustard and Goldcourt that we'll look at. Over the page 54, the necessary condition for obtaining the assistance of equity in the rescission process is that the representee, again, I'd underline that for ground two, the representee should make counter restitution. In a contractual case, this will ordinarily involve him restoring to the representor any benefits which he has himself received under the contract or their equivalent value. Then there's a citation from the Australian case which tends to proceed on the basis um, of election, sorry, rescission by election. Um, but as we know, of course, rescission in equity can occur by decree, and in this case, did, and only did, occur by decree. That's ITS. And then finally, there's the GE case. This is one of the two cases cited by, or raised by my learned friend last Friday. That has found its way into the authorities bundle tab 27 at the back of volume 2. The issue before the Court of Appeal, this is quite recent, February of this year, the issue before the Court of Appeal in that case was a limitation issue, <coughs> which you see set out. You see it set out um, in paragraph 1 of Lord Justice Henderson's judgment, with which Lord Lady Justice Asplin and Lord Justice Burst agreed. And the simple issue before the court was whether the six-year limitation period for deceit under Section 2 of the 1980 Act, um, at least arguably, applies by analogy, pursuant to Section 36.1, to a claim for equitable decision of a contract. So, so this case is dealing with claims for equitable rescission. So we're not in the territory of rescission by election, where someone goes to court to get a declaration that they did rescind. We are in the realms which we are in in the present case before my lords of a claim for equitable rescission of a contract for fraudulent misrepresentation. I, my learned friend, will take you to this case. Um, I dare say for other matters. For my purposes. So I can ask my lords to go to page 964. And paragraph 63 and 64. If my, if my lords could note those two paragraphs. with emphasis on that line in the middle of 63, all claims for equitable rescission seek to restore the claimant to the position that he was in before entering into the relevant contract. It doesn't really um, say things any more clearly than Lord Wright did in Spence and Crawford, which is that restitutio in integrum is a, an essential component and precondition to uh, rescission, 
then when someone goes to court or a tribunal and asks for a decree of rescission on the basis of, resti of personal restitution and gets their decree of rescission, then what is said about that personal restitution liability forms part and parcel of, of the decree of re rescission. That's my ring fence point. Um, so that's, those are the three authorities I was showing you on the nature of equitable rescission. We then get to the first of the two substantive propositions in the skeletons. Um, the first proposition being, you can't have proprietary restitutionary liability, aka a rescission trust, in the absence of personal restitutionary liability, aka a claim for unjust enrichment. And that's because the juridical rationale for the rescission trust lies in unjust enrichment or the prevention of unjust enrichment. So in my model of A, B, C, and D, A is Vale, B is the um, arbitral respondent, BSGR, um, B can only become a rescission trustee, a constructive trustee, in relation to assets, the value of which he is liable to A um, in the law of restitution on a personal basis. Um, there is no, there's no authority and no principle that could begin to justify the imposition of a proprietary li restitutionary liability where there was no personal restitutionary liability, or indeed, on a pro tanto basis, uh, the imposition of a rescission trust uh, over assets that had a value higher than B's liability in personal restitution. The two go hand in hand. Now, it is said against me on this that the, um, the law of personal restitution has different ingredients and different defences than the law of, of um, constructive trust. And it's possible that I, um, in, when you're looking at the realms of personal restitution, your defendant, here B, might have a defence of bona fide change of position. But the short answer to that is that can never arise in a case of fraudulent misrepresentation. So it may well be that the proposition I'm advancing is confined to rescission for fraud. And the reason it can never arise, the discrepancy can never arise between the personal and the proprietary is because B is a fraudster by definition, because he procured the contract by fraud and it has been rescinded on that basis. Therefore, B can never have a bona fide change of position defense as an answer to personal restitution. And likewise, B could never be equity's darling. So it could be that there is something unique about rescission for fraud that means that you can never have a misalignment between B's personal restitutionary position and his proprietary restitutionary position. I don't base um, this proposition on that, but I can see that that is an answer to the thing that is said against me. And, and that being so, um, if B is found on a final and conclusive basis not to have any personal restitutionary liability to A, there can never be proprietary restitutionary liability. That is another way of saying um, what the discussion about the, um, the caterpillar and the, and the butterfly with my Lord, Lord Justice Lewis is. If B has been found, if A and B have arbitrated in this case that point, and it has been found that A's equity never crystallized into an equitable interest um, as exigible against B, then that's the end of it. The oddity here is A was the victim of the fraud, B was the fraudster. As it happened, the money passed for whatever reason from C to B. So you look at A and B and you say, oh, you can't get um, the money back, that didn't uh, hand over any money and uh, it's really damages. But that then rules out C. And if you had a different analysis, there's rescission, there's an equitable interest, subject to whether or not the third party can actually maintain it. Why should you stop C, who's the payee or, from being able to enforce proprietary remedies against a fraudster who's got money of that on this analysis he shouldn't have got? Because it's happened to have been the payment mechanism. 
Well, that's ground two of the appeal. Yeah. Um, if, if I may, I would prefer not to call... You would have to bring cameras, OK? Well, no, no, I'll answer it now, but I'd prefer not to call Varley International C, because in, in the model that I've fixed in my head, which you see through my supplemental skeleton, okay. uh, my clients are yes. C and D. Call him A1, then. I think we could have A1 and A2. OK, call him A2. <laughs> so, I don't get what he's called. But, but, and deal with him when you deal with him. Well, the, reason a, the short answer is the reason A2 can never have the equitable interest is because he never holds the equity. Yes, that's your case, but yeah. that, 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 that uses the answer to... <laughs> The question is why not? Because if rescission was an event, uh, it just so happened that because of the arrangements of payment, the money that went to the fraudster, and surely the aim of uh, this form of restitution is to recover from the fraudster money that he shouldn't have got because of the fraud. A1 can't get it, well, um, but A2 could get it, in subject to this second point, uh, and it seems rather odd to say, no, 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 you can never do that. You can never unwind a fraud because of the payment mechanism that A1 and A2 chose. Nobody, nobody is saying that. I'm not saying that. In another world, Vale would have sought to join Vale International to the arbitration and ask the tribunal's um, permission under the LCA rules, which I gave you a reference to. So, so under the LCA rules, the tribunal has the power to join other parties if someone applies and if the third party, or if the third party consents. There was they nothing won't party, to... so why can't they go in an ordinary court? Well, this was arbitration. So Vale, the first point is Vale could have joined Vale International if it had wanted to and would probably have got that permission. It's very difficult to see how the tribunal would not have wanted the paying party before it, given certainly given the terms of its award that subsequently flowed. Well, if your ground two is right, why would that have helped? Well, I'm, I'm dealing with... I, 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 I... It, it, it's got come not... to your ground two, but if your ground two is right, it seems to me that the arbitration should have lasted five minutes rather than five years because well, you, you say Vail International has no claim because the rescission equity was Vail's alone and Vail's has no claim because Vail has no claim because it didn't pay out the money in the first place. Yeah. Well Q E D. Well Well anyway let's come to let's come can, to ground. But I'm only halfway through what yes, I was saying, which is that yeah. Vale International could have been joined and Vale's lawyers could have run the agency analysis. And, and, and we, we are now in a world where the tribunal has said what it's done and has decreed what it has decreed, so we are living with that. Whether Varley don't like it, and ground two arises out of a claim designed to get around that result. So this, is, this is their way of trying to skirt around the award. But the, um, if Varley had argued in the arbitration that Varley International had paid uh, as its agent, then it might have stood a better chance of winning on the personal restitution claim but it didn't argue it, uh, unfortunately. And that is the answer on ground two. That's one of the answers on ground two, is that they just missed a trick in the arbitration. So, so, so my, my position on ground two doesn't create problems in the world. The problem in this particular little world has been created by the fact that a, a key point wasn't run in the arbitration on behalf of Vale. They got a bad result. They're stuck with the result. They're trying to get around it now by getting a non-party who happened to pay the money to, to bring a proprietary claim. We say you can't because you, you were never the holder of the rescission equity. And th this court should not allow the raw facts of this case, which flow from that outcome, if I can put it like that, in the arbitration, to make bad law. Because you sh you, th this court should not be motivated by an outcome in an arbitration that flow from the failure to take a point, pretty obvious point, actually, from Balstead and Reynolds. Failure to take that point led to a bad outcome. Yeah. That bad outcome should not um, drive this court to try and split the equity and say that more than one, that equity can be split between different entities and you could end up with the horror show, which is what it would be, of having B owe money, in, in other cases, B would owe money on a personal restitutionary basis to A, so we'd have a personal civil liability to A for X. B at the same time and arising from the same rescinded transaction is constituted as a constructive trustee in relation to someone else, A2, as we're calling them here, there is no mechanism for, for controlling double recovery and accumulation of remedies, and that's the problem on ground two. You can't control that through case management. You can't, I, I'm not aware of a single situation in which a court has been asked to or been able to case manage a situation where B is both a trustee of assets, a constructive trustee of assets to one claimant over here, and also owes a personal um, civil liability and restitution arising from the same rescinded transaction to another claimant over here. One might be arbitrating and one might be litigating. We just don't know. 
Um, and so, and that demonstrates why splitting the equity is so dangerous. If, you, if you're going to go subatomic on this and split something which is the smallest particle known in our law, which is this mere equity, it's the smallest, weakest thing that we have in our law, if you're going to go into that and split that into neurons and electrons, you're going to get into trouble. And you're going to make bad law in order to help a, a claimant before this court who made a bad decision in the arbitration. And it may be said the tribunal made a bad decision, but they didn't have the point before them. Before we get to ground two, I think at the moment you're on the question of whether um, a personal liability in restitution is an essential component of a proprietary claim. And you've suggested that there may be a special case of in, in fraud cases um, because, because the fraudulent fee can never rely on a change of position in the case. But, um, I mean, rather than having a special rule in fraud cases, which doesn't seem to have emerged anywhere else, may the position not be that these are, in fact, simply two distinct remedies. Uh, in fraud cases, they will tend to be aligned. In other cases, they sometimes will be and sometimes won't be. What, what's wrong with that? And um, following on from that, is there any authority which supports your saying that a personal claim is an essential component of a proprietary claim against B. Um, what's wrong with it, um, my lord, is that the, um, the law's response in this area is, is a response to prevent unjust enrichment. That's why that is the juridical basis and driver behind the constructive trust. And um, given, and there's authority which suggests that, but nothing that's analysed it deeper. This is obviously an, a, a bit of a feeding frenzy for the academics, this particular area of law. Um, but, but I would submit that it's elementary, that the, the court responding with a constructive trust in this situation is, is doing so on, an, on a restitutionary basis. The impetus is restitutionary. It's to stop B. It's to protect A in relation to his claim against, and effectively it's a, a form of securing A's personal restitutionary claim against B by constituting B a trustee over assets to the value of that claim. That's what this is. It's entirely ancillary, and it's entirely parasitic on the underlying unjust enrichment analysis. Now, there are snippets in the case law which suggest that that is so, but there is nothing directly on point. Can I show you uh, what there is? Goffin Jones, first of all, bundle three of the authorities. <clears throat> and that's tab 31. And we looked at the chapter earlier, but this time it's 40-17, bundle page 1032. And it's um, three lines in. We consider that the revesting of title to assets following rescission should be seen as a proprietary remedy for unjust enrichment, and we discuss the legal mechanisms by which this is achieved immediately below. And then they go on to, to discuss all that. And we looked earlier at um, a paragraph at 425. I would ask my lords, um, but maybe not now, to, to pay attention to what follows, because that's the legal mechanism, and that's what we've been discussing. But I rely on it for that proposition, that this is about, uh, it's a proprietary remedy for unjust enrichment. Constructive trust is the law's response to unjust enrichment, but it only arises where there is, and insofar as there is, unjust enrichment. That's Goff and Jones. If you can take up the Privy Council decision of Gold Corp in Authorities Bundle 1. This is an appeal uh, from the Court of Appeal of New Zealand in 1994. And um, briefly speaking, the facts were that, uh, that a whole range of um, investors had invested in bullion. Um, it had turned out to be um, a scam. Um, but 
allocating their money to a particular bullion uh, was a particular problem in the case. And they, and they sought to, um, there was then the problem with the insolvency or receiver, I think allocated over the, um, the fraudster and its assets. And the case was largely concerned with um, the situation arising out of, or rather whether there could be a proprietary claim in circumstances where no one could really show with specificity what they'd bought or where it was um, in, a, in a pile of existent or indeed non-existent bullion. Um, can I take you to the speech or indeed opinion being the Privy Council of Lord Mustel advice. I'm sorry, page 261 of the bundle. And it's the, um, the paragraph that's been highlighted in the margin there. If I can ask you to, to read from C, where it says whether the proprietary interest said to derive uh, down to F money back. Obviously, um, you will know that I rely on the phrase, on the, on the one that starts first, any such proprietary right must have as its starting point a personal claim by the purchaser to the return of the price, i.e. a personal restitution claim. Well, you need to go on and read, really, because yes. there they were saying that um, there was uh, no attempt to rescind the contract. It isn't really talking about this tripartite situation that we've got into. It really is dealing with something else. I don't think it was trying to lay down a principle for this kind of case, was it? Well, um, with respect, my lord, I'm, this, I'm not currently on the tripartite situation. No, I appreciate that, but what you're trying to do is say that this is the law. But the answer is this is the law in a simple situation where the purchasers weren't, weren't even trying to rescind the contract. It's a big step then Correct. to say yep. that it also applies to all sorts of other situations. Absolutely. What Lord, like what Lord Mussel do, is doing in this passage is he's contemplating the different bases by, upon which or mechanisms by which a proprietary interest could be claimed. What he's saying is yeah. where the contract remains in existence, yeah. you can't. That would be yeah. another way of summarising it. Yes. Rather than saying it must have its starting point in all cases, in all circumstances. Yes. Yeah. Yes. But what, he, what, what he's saying nevertheless holds true even if you have rescinded the contract. Because when he says any such proprietary right must have as its starting point a personal claim by the purchaser to the return of the price, um, he is what he's doing there is iterating something which is uh, which is fundamental, That's what you and elemental. Yes. Yeah, and he, I mean he's he's almost taking it as a fundamental proposition of English law is that English law would never respond with a proprietary remedy, um, absent a personal liability. It just wouldn't do it. It doesn't happen. And but sometimes finding authorities to say things that basic is a struggle itself. But there you have Lord Mustel assuming something so elemental. He chooses those few words just to to express it. And then I'm going to show you one other reference, and then I was going to try and illustrate it with an example. Um, the next reference is in bundle two of the authorities. It's NCA and Rob at tab 22. of Sir Terence Etherton as Chancellor sitting at first instance uh, from 2014. The case, what the case decides and what it's known for is that it's possible for a party to rescind a contract on the grounds of his counterparty's fraud even if the fraud postdates the contract and didn't induce the contract. 
and, and, and the Chancellor uh, said that there was no policy reason in English law why a party should not, in certain circumstances, be able to, to rescind the contract, even for post-contractual fraud. That's what it's about, and that's what it's known for. But in the process of considering that, if I can take you to paragraph 48, on page 776 in the bundle, and just ask you to read that. So this is where he embarks upon on the reasoning which leads to his conclusion that yes, you can rescind for post-contractual non-inducive non fraud. But in passing in the middle there, he says there are some who would say that the proprietary restitutionary remedy unjust enrichment cannot lie. So what the Chancellor assumed, just as what Lord Mustell asserted, was that what you're dealing with here is a proprietary restitutionary remedy for unjust enrichment. You need to have, as a base, the personal restitutionary liability in order for the law to then impose on top of it, by way of security, effectively, a, a trust, a constructive trust. If you don't have one, you don't have the other. And that operates, um, that operates pro tanto. So you can't have a rescission trust um, without personal restitution liability. And in my submission, as far as I need to go this far, you can't have a rescission trust out with the extent of such liability. And so let's posit a very simple example. A, a is the good person and B is still the fraudster in this example. A buys two cakes from B. They're 50p each, contract price one pound. A pays the pound to B. B uh, delivers one cake to A. Um, now I've put this in as an aside because it explains why equitable rescission is necessary. A eats half of the cake. A doesn't know whether he can just say, I rescind, because he doesn't know what value the half cake has. So A goes to court, or maybe he goes to a, a, an emergency arbitrator. It doesn't matter for present purposes. He um, vindicates his right to rescind. He seeks from a court or tribunal an equitable um, decree of rescission. Um, and as part of that, the tribunal or court has to decide the value of his half-eaten cake that he's got. The court or tribunal decides it's worth nil. Who wants a half-eaten cake? Um, so A has got his decree of rescission on the basis he doesn't have to return the half-eaten cake. What's the liability position? Um, restitutio in integral <coughs> must require or must assume that B owes 50p back to A because B supplied a 50p cake but kept the pound net off. B owes A 50p. That's the basis for rescission or as my learned friend would say, the consequence. I would say it is actually restitutio in integrum in this case. Um, um, if the rescission was for fraud, let's say A discovered that B was his arch enemy and had lied about who he was after eating his, um, his cake, half eating his cake, so he's rescinded for fraud, then you might have the situation of the rescission trust, or indeed without fraud. It probably doesn't matter on what the basis of rescission was. Uh, is the rescission trust for the pound in B's hands, or for the 50p? The answer is it must be for the 50p, because B has supplied B has supplied that cake that was worth 50p. B is only unjustly enriched to 50p, and therefore any trust that arises and is imposed by the law upon B, and which constitutes him as a constructive trustee, must be, and can only be for the 50p. And that's either because He's only been unjustly enriched to the extent of 50p, i.e. a pound minus the cake, or uh, because his unjust enrichment, even if it was a pound gross, is only um, at the expense of A to the extent of 50p, because A got his cake and ate it. And, and that example uh, illustrates my point, which is that uh, proprietary restitutionary liability is parasitic upon personal restitutionary liability, both in a binary sense of yea or nay, and in this case the tribunal said nay, but also in a pro tanto sense. You can't have a rescission trust 
that operates or bites on assets of a greater value than the trustee's personal restitutionary liability. And that is why Lord Mustle is right when he said it has to start with such a claim. And that is why the Chancellor, Sir Terence Etherton, as he then was, was right to describe it, albeit in passing, as a proprietary restitutionary remedy for unjust enrichment. That is the area of law uh, that we are in. So that's the first substantive proposition that the, the, the proprietary restitutionary claim depends for its existence upon the personal restitutionary claim. The second substantive proposition is that the equity has to transmit perfectly through the chain. This, I can take this one more, uh, more quickly. Um, so in other words, in my A, B, C, D situation, A holds the equity vis-a-vis -vis B at the point of contracting. A converts his equity, uh, if, if A converts his equity into an equitable interest against B upon rescission, um, B, um, he would only be able to assert it against D if he could also assert it against C. And the way to illustrate this, uh, other than the fact that it's the simple invocation of the most basic principles of equity, is to posit a situation in which C is equity's darling and transmits, uh, clean, cleanses the title and transmits the assets to D. In that case, D could never be a rescission trustee. Forget tracing. Uh, D could never be, as a matter of substantive law, a rescission trustee. Why? Because the equitable interest, and indeed the mere equity before it was converted into an equitable interest, depending on the facts, um, never reached D. In the, in the appellant skeleton, it's put as a form of name o dat. You can't give what you don't have. But in some ways, it's almost the, the converse of name o dat. It's like you give, you give what you have, as it were. Um, and in our case, uh, it all broke down with B. We don't, obviously, C and D are assumed not to be equities, darling, my clients, for today's purposes. It all broke down at the first stage, because A's equity, his mere equity, was never converted into an equitable interest as against B. Another way of saying the same thing is B never became a constructive trustee over anything. And as a result of that, uh, C, neither C nor D nor E through to Z could ever be fixed with any proprietary restitutionary liability. It was cut off at the root. And uh, there's an authority I was going to show you in passing, actually, which is if you have bundle two of the authorities open. It's a case called uh, SFO versus Lexi Holdings. It's tab 18. One eight. And if I can ask my lords to go to six five nine using the bundle, it's page three eight nine of the report. This is part of the uh, judgment of Lord Justice Keane. And if I can ask my lords to read the paragraph at G. Six five nine. Six five nine of the bundle. Yeah. And letter G. That paragraph yeah. starts moreover. Thank you. Yeah. And I rely on the words that process of its nature involves identifying a continuing equitable interest at all stages leading up to the identification of the asset or assets over which the proprietary remedy is ultimately asserted. Now, the context, the legal context was different. Um, and indeed, the context in which this normally comes up is equitable tracing, where, as I said at the outset, you have to be able to show your, the transmission um, down the chain of the equitable interest in order to affect tracing. And when our case isn't dealing with the situation in Lexi, and it isn't dealing with tracing. Tracing is assumed, or traceability is assumed for today's purposes. But the same elementary principles apply, that the inchoate equity has to transmit perfectly through the chain in order that, at the point of rescission, it becomes an equitable interest in the hands of whoever, and, and likewise the equitable interest if it's already vested. And that doesn't happen here. So our case is 
what's reduced down to it is relatively simple. And it's that um, A, A held the equity, nobody else, nobody else could hold that equity. That equity was crystallized upon the decree of equitable rescission. And that decree of equitable rescission, by its terms, was based upon the absence or negation or preclusion of any personal restitutionary liability on the part of B in relation to the half billion. Let's just call that X. Um, it flows as a matter of law from that uh, that B could never be a rescission trustee in relation to X because the equity vanished into the ether and never became an equitable interest. And it flows as a matter of law from that proposition that nobody else even if not equities, darling, and even if holding traceable proceeds, nobody else could ever be fixed with that equitable interest, or putting it another way, nobody else could ever become a rescission trustee or a constructive trustee. It's really quite simple. It works in stages, um, but each one is legally robust, and it's a complete answer. And then that gets us to sun life and why, uh, why or how my clients can uh, hold Vale to its decision. But before, before we look at sunlight, can I just ask my lords to look at another recent case cited by my learned friend last Friday, and that's the case of Ward and Savile. It's volume three, tab 28. judgment is given by, this was from May this, uh, March this year, the lead judgment given by Sir Julian Flo, Chancellor. And you see the issue before the court in paragraph one. And what was said um, in these proceedings, um, let's, if we put this, if we map this onto my A, B, um, C situation, effectively you'd had prior court proceedings, the 2015 proceedings between A and B. A had obtained a series of declarations from Mr. Justice Butcher, referred to as the Butcher Declaration. We'll look at those in a moment. A then sued C in subsequent court proceedings and sought to argue that C was bound by the Butcher Declaration. So you will instantly see um, that this is a case of what I would call a burden case, where the non-party is said to take the burden <clears throat> of a judgment or finding in prior proceedings to which it wasn't a party. So it's a burden case rather than a benefit case like ours. Um, if you look at paragraph 14, you see what the declarations were at the top of, I don't think this one is numbered because it went in late. Um, you see that at the top of the page following paragraph 14. Number one, three declarations. Number one, that the claimants were induced by fraudulent misrepresentations of the defendants then before the court. Let's call that inducement. Number two, each of the claimant has or retains a beneficial interest in monies paid to those defendants. So that's your beneficial or equitable interest declaration. And then number three, entitled to trace into their property. It is not, uh, and this is important, it is not a decree of equitable rescission. It's not a decree of rescission at all. It's, it's three declarations, one about inducement, the other about the existence of a beneficial interest, and, then, and the last one about tracing. There is a reference in the next paragraph, 15, to the pleading in the, case, in the new set of proceedings between A and C, where it says um, that it, the contracts were procured by fraud and that they had rescinded them. Um, but they, the key point is that the, the relevant declarations from the first set of proceedings are not and did not involve a decree of rescission. I won't, we don't need to spend too much time on the analysis. Paragraph 27 shows you what the two grounds to appeal were.
And if I can ask you um, to then go, please, to paragraph 72 for the discussion. And if you uh, pick up paragraph 74, now, this is, follows a citation from Mr. Justice Hickenbotham in the Hertfordshire County Council case about judgments in REM and rights in REM. And it says the present case doesn't involve considerations of what the Parliament conferred statutory jurisdiction. But the same concern to avoid procedural injustice, the party being bound by a judgment without an opportunity to be heard, should dictate a similarly cautious approach. So the underlying legal policy is one of avoiding procedural injustice where a non-party is bound by a judgment or finding in proceedings to which he or she was not a party. You then see, um, in effect, the ratio of the decision on this ground, which is paragraph 76 to 80. I, I don't want to dwell on that for now. My learned friend can take you to it if need be. What it shows, however, is that the court undertakes a heavily contextual analysis of the particular, in this case, the butcher declarations or the relevant finding or judgment from the prior proceedings. And it's all about, well, what is the what was that about and what was it intended to do? And, and nothing akin, like I say, nothing akin to a decree of equitable decision. You then get paragraph 81 turning to the ground of appeal in relation to um, legal effect in the absence of the judgment in REM. Sorry, paragraph 81. And a consideration inevitably of um, Hollington and Hewthorne in that context. Mm -hmm. Paragraph 86, I say, is important. Six lines down. The suggestion that a stranger to an earlier judgment is bound by it is contrary to fundamental principles of natural justice. Well, we all know that. Um, we were brought up with that. Um, Hollington and Hewthorne is fairly familiar territory, isn't it? It is. I mean, so far, there's no, no, nothing in this case which is in the least surprising. No, it's not cited by me, it's cited by my little friend. But, um, but I, I found those two parts in it are important for my proposition, which I'm going to develop now in the context of Sun Life, that there is in fact an important distinction that should be drawn between the situation where a third party is sought to be bound by a finding or judgment in prior proceedings to which he wasn't a party, on the one hand, that's what I call the burden situation, mm -hmm. and a situation like ours, where a third party is simply holding uh, its, its litigation adversary to a finding against it in its own prior proceedings. In other words, um, taking the benefit, as it were, of a finding or judgment in the prior proceedings. The benefit and burden situation is dealt with together in Sun Life as if it was one and the same. But actually, the rationale, the underlying rationale and why the law does what it does is very different. In the burden situation, it grates against fundamental principles of natural justice that a non-party can be stuck with a, a finding to which it wasn't in which it wasn't involved. That those um, those um, fundamental principles of natural justice aren't engaged when all the third party is doing is seeking to hold um, its adversary to findings which affected it from its own prior um, process. Now that's not how it's looked at in Sun Life, but we say um, Sun Life is over time. And for all the other reasons, when we come to it now, it's a reason to uh, find that this case is, is materially different from Sun Life. So let's turn to that. Now, if my Lord's got that in a separate, did that come through in a separate bundle lodged by Vale? I'm going to assume, um, given that the reference to this case emanated from the bench, that the, 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 my Lords are familiar with the factual lie of the land. There had been a, there had, the wrinkle in this case, which does, isn't material, is that the second legal process was also an arbitration. That's one wrinkle, but it doesn't matter because from that arbitration there lay an appeal to the commercial court, to Mr Justice Toulson, and from then on into this court, to the Court of Appeal. So that's one wrinkle. The other wrinkle is that in our ABC scenario, a doesn't start the second legal process in this case. A is the defendant, or I should say arbitral respondent in the second legal process. And, a, um, and what happened was the tribunal um, found um, that the finding from the first, um, the first arbitration, the signet arbitration on the coverage issue, um, was not binding 
because it was effectively an obiter finding, because the Signa Tribunal had, had avoided the OCK Act reinsurance. So the tribunal found that it was not binding on A. In other words, that C couldn't take the benefit of that um, early, uh, finding in the earlier tribunal. Mr. Justice Toulson, as he then was, allowed an appeal from that in the commercial court, but the Court of Appeal overturned that and reinstated the, the arbitrator's decision in the second arbitration, the Lincoln arbitration, to the effect that um, Lincoln, Lincoln couldn't hold Sun Phoenix uh, to that earlier um, to that earlier finding in the earlier arbitration. The, the, the ratio for that decision, as we know, is that the, the, find, the coverage finding in the first arbitration was overturned using that language analogously in arbitration, which I've done so far today, and I think is permissible. It was over to because the, the Signa tribunal, or the tribunal in the Signa arbitration, had avoided the reinsurance. So that the coverage finding about this book of business was not a necessary part of that um, avoidance decision and was held to be over to. So that's, that's the ratio of Court of Appeal in Sun Life is that the reason that that had no effect, that the coverage finding had no effect outside the signal arbitration. Can, can something similar be said in this case, that the um, decision on personal restitution, um, in a sense, was not essential because the arbitrators decided that uh, exactly the same sum of money uh, had to be paid under a different legal heading. Um, well, that's, that's the fundamental error into which the learned judge below fell in my submission. He's, he's, he's separated the, um, the, pure, the pure rescission part of the decree of rescission from the denial of, rest, of personal restitution for the half million. But when I've shown you the arbitration documents, which show, and in fact, this is consistent with Lord Wright and Spence and Crawford, is that whatever you have to work through in order to satisfy yourself that restitutio in integrum is achievable or in equity substantially achievable forms the basis of the decision for rescission. It's part of the package. So in my submission, and um, I've been I hopefully hopefully clear about that, is that that's the ring fence point. That's the ratio here of the rescission decree from the arbitration, the Vale arbitration. And I showed you the, the documents which sought rescission, sought return of that money as part of rescission. And, and this goes to the tribunal's substantive jurisdiction, um, my lord, and that, that's a key point, is that the return of that money was sought as part of the rescission claim. It wasn't sought as a separate claim in the arbitration. So the only basis for the tribunal to have had jurisdiction over that point was under the rescission claim, not the separate damages claim, based on, which was compensatory and based on loss. So, so I do understand that's the point against me. It's the point that the judge made, and we're going to look at his judgment um, in a wee bit, um, but, it, but we say it's wrong. It misunderstands the very concept of a decree of rescission per Lord Wright, and indeed it misunderstands this particular decree of rescission because of the way it was sought and the way it was ordered. Um, so everything said about issue four, as it was called in Sun Life, is overturned. Um, now, that, if that was my only submission, then I wouldn't get very far with it, and I see the shaking of the heads. Um, the relevance of that submission goes to the burden-benefit point, the burden-benefit distinction I'm drawing, because even though Sun Life was a benefit case where the non-party sought, had sought to take the benefit of a finding in an earlier arbitration, and even though all three Lord Justices say, no, you can't even do that, taking the benefit, the fact that that discussion is overturned um, in, my, in my submission, means it has a status which allows you, my lords, to subject it to a certain amount of scrutiny that you might not otherwise. And so my first submission um, about Sun Life is because issue four and its treatment is obiter, you have the freedom uh, to view it through the lens of Ward and Savile that I showed you um, a few minutes ago uh, and impose upon the reasoning in Sun Life the burden benefit distinction, and ask yourselves, um, does the rationale, the natural justice rationale, mean that a non-party can't take the benefit? Answer no, because it's got nothing to do with fixing a non-party with the burden. So that's the first submission. If you then look to see the various bases uh, that are put forward, or rather rationales, 
you can see that our case is fundamentally different. In taking Lord Justice Mance's uh, judgment and picking it up at paragraph 64, you see that he gives a series of five um, reasons for why the submission by Mr. Hunter on behalf of Lincoln, Lincoln being C in my model, uh, can't be accepted. The first one um, is to do with the dicta of Mr. Justice Saville. You, you, you better tell us what Mr. Hunter's new principle was. Well, his principle sought to take advantage of the burden benefits distinction. Um, I don't shy from that. That's what Mr. And you see that from uh, paragraph. Well, it's uh, 53, isn't it, at the bottom? I oh, know that's the same thing. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, 63, at the, at the top, actually. At the top, rather. Yeah. In the present case, Lincoln, yes. so that's, that's C, that's the non-party C on my analogue. The stranger is seeking to rely on the signal award as against a party to it. And then there's this, such attraction as there is in Mr Hunter's suggested principle derives from this distinction. So I don't shy from the fact that the Court of Appeal Overter in Sun Life brushed aside the burden-benefit distinction. Yeah. It was a benefit case, and they said it doesn't make a difference. But you have to look at the reasoning for why that didn't make a difference under the rubric of, the, of it being obiter in order to understand it. So Lord Justice Mance has five reasons. The first we don't need to worry about because it's to do with um, the dicta. The second one was the need for mutuality. Principles of res judicata and issue stopping commonly operate mutually. And then if you take that all the way down to the bottom, to, to E, he says there's other ways of dealing with um, the problem, and that is um, collateral challenges and abusive process. Now, I don't, want to get, I don't want to get back into the abusive process point right now, but he says that's other ways of dealing with it. So he has mutuality. His third reason in paragraph 66 says it's based on general justice, and it's not convenient or just. So this, in a sense, is a justice point to allow a stranger to enjoy and to enjoy that, um, the benefit of someone else's um, legal process. His fourth is fortuity in paragraph 67, a strong element of fortuity here. And his fifth is the distinctions between arbitration and litigation, principle being joinder and consolidation, and indeed confidentiality and privacy. Now, before we go on to the, the, the next Lord Justices, what they had to say, I want to go through each of those in turn. If we go back to paragraph 65, mutuality. Well, we have mutuality here. We have mutuality here because when you ring fence the decree of equitable rescission, which includes the denial of personal restitutionary liability, everyone, has to, everyone takes that. We, we take it as defendants in this litigation, and that's the, con that's the concession I showed you at the outset, and the defendants, sorry, the claimants are stuck with it too. So there is mutuality here, as long as you have the ring fence. Now it might be said against me, well, your, the ring fence might be a bit blurry in places. Answer, it's not. It's very clear what that decree of rescission involved. And even if there were any blurs in the ring fence, that's part and parcel of what these disputes are always like. That doesn't mean there isn't mutuality. If parties can't agree about exactly where you draw the ring fence, that's, that often happens in cases of res judicata. Does it depend on your concession? What happens if in another case the party doesn't concede that um, they were bound by the findings of fraud but still wanted the benefit? You would say then in that case on those facts there was no mutuality and they can't get the benefit. Well, if, if my lords are with me on this appeal, the, the, your decision will be cited to that party in, in a strikeout application or some form of summary application. You'd have to choose. Um, but is that the position, that if the party refuses mutuality, then he can't get the benefit, but if he chooses to accept it, he does get the benefit, it, no, dependent on his choice? That's not the proposition. Ah, right. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not making a tactical stipulation here to meet a hard, to meet a hard point or to tick a box. Um, I, the concession that's made in the appellant's skeleton recognises is a recognition of a principle. The principle being... So the person has to accept the findings of fraud and has to accept the recession, even if he says, 
but it's wrong. I've got the evidence to show I never lied. No, in, no nobody has to accept the findings of fraud because they are they're factual. Um, the, the decree of equitable rescission is, is effectively sui generis. That's what my submission amounts to saying. It is a juridical creature apart from all others. And it, it's it, it's because it rescinds a contract ab initio between the contracting parties and as part and parcel. But it's granted because there was fraud. That's the basis for it. But uh, and it doesn't matter. Even if it's a completely wrong finding and the party is fundamentally agreed by it, a third party, a stranger to the arbitration, is bound by a rescission granted on the basis of fraud. It's, um, they would uh, effectively, yes. Mm -hmm. Um, but I don't need to go that far because my case is a be is a benefit case. But you've got to have mutuality. Of yes, you have that. to have mutuality. So therefore, there has to be a benefit and burden binding. So they have to be bound by a finding of rescission on the basis of fraud. If it's if they to get the benefit, indeed, they don't have a choice. They are bound. Enough. That's why they can get the benefit. If it is a if rescission is asserted against another another non-party in subsequent litigation in X years time. And it is asserted in the way it is asserted here, i.e., there's a pleaded reference to the award, and that the award binds them. Then that party, that defendant in those proceedings, in my submission, would logically be bound by that rescission finding, and that is because a decree of equitable rescission, like a divorce decree, is a thing in the world. It's it start it is between it's bilateral in the sense that it affects the parties to it. Bilateral if there's two parties, but once it's done. Um, that's it. That that contract is rescinded. Now the basis on which rescission happens is entirely factual. It could be innocent. It could be negligent. In this case, it was fraudulent. Um, whether someone then wants to bring a fraud case, whether A, who's got his rescission, then wants to bring a fraud case against C, D, X, Y, Z, he still has to prove the fraud, because the fraud findings don't bind anybody else. The fact of rescission is a hard legal fact for all time. That contract has gone. And it's not for anyone else to say that it hasn't, quite frankly. So, so that's mutuality. And, it's not, and it doesn't come about through some form of voluntary or tactical stipulation in this case in order to tick the box. It's just logically consistent with our case on what equitable uh, rescission is. Equitable rescission is a hard legal fact for all time. Um, that's mutuality. If you go to Lord Justice Mance's paragraph 66, based on general justice, um, we say... Actually, that doesn't apply in the benefit situation, or, or at least it applies a lot less strongly in the benefit situation than it does in the burden situation, C, Ward, and Savile. Paragraph 67, fortuity. Well, what's the fortuity in our case, I would ask, where Vale itself has started legal proceedings, pleaded the award, pleaded rescission through the award, has got... Um, sanctioned from the court to refer to the award on the basis that it needs the award to bring this claim. There's no fortuity in that. Our case is so far away from Sun Phoenix's position as arbitral respondent, where it was, it was arbitrated against by Lincoln in the second arbitration, and it sought, Sun Phoenix sought to set up, or rather Lincoln, the arbitral claimant, sought to set up a finding from an earlier arbitration. There was fortuity in that. Mr. Lord Justice Jacobs calls it happenstance when we come to his judgment. There is no happenstance and no fortuity in this case. Well, it might be said that there is fortuity that Vale are stuck with the obviously flawed reasoning of the arbitrators, which, as you've accepted, is internally inconsistent. Now, they've agreed to accept that as against um, BSRG, so they're stuck with it. But they haven't agreed to accept that against anybody else. Well, that fortuity, if it is, best, if it is to be described as one, arose from their failure to take an obvious point and to get that remedy the agency point. So, so should that fortuity, or should the later fortuity, be the one that's visited upon my client? I would say not, if you're analysing this through the lens of justice. Um, and you don't have to establish fortuity for the principle to apply. What you're saying is you don't normally have a situation where a bar, an award between party A and B binds C. So we don't have to show, for, or Mr. Talani doesn't have to show that there's some fortu fortuity here. The general principle applies, and it's just shown that often there will be an element of fortuity in here. There may be. Well, well, what we don't know also is the extent to which the fortuity stroke happenstance ground uh, weighs in the balance. I would have thought, um, stepping back from it all, that's the mutuality point 
um, is a more prominent point than the fortuity point, and indeed inherent justice. So, so fortuity comes. These are reasons comes... for a principle, and the principle is you can't bind a stranger. No. So we're not trying to establish whether one of these legal situations exists. They are disparate reasons, some of which may apply in one case. None of them may apply in other cases, but the principle is. Yeah. The, well, it's not, it's not the principle that you can't bind a stranger, because that's the burden situation. It's the principle that a stranger can't take well, the benefit. The principle is, is that contracts, sorry, that uh, contractual awards in a court or tribunal between parties A and B are not binding on C. That's the principle. Yes. And these are reasons why the judge, uh, the judge has thought that that applies. But they are reasons, and again, when we track through the, the other two Lord Justices, that, that and their judgments it might be a way of calibrating the strength given to these reasons, because we'll see that mutuality is the common denominator. So in my submission, um, I, I mean, I do, I do stand on what I say, that if there's any fortuity in our case, it's the fortuity that um, Barley's lawyers um, didn't take the points they should have taken in the arbitration and are now trying to repair a bad situation. So mutuality is the important one, and you can tick that. General justice, we say, is an important, is an important one, and you can tick that. You've said general justice three times now, but I wouldn't have thought on the assumed facts of this case that that's likely to be your strongest point. Um, by reference to the findings of fraud on the part of BSGR, my lord. It's, assu it, it's assumed for the purposes of this appeal as it was before the judge, not only that BSGR were, were fraudsters, but that your clients are not bona fide purchasers. They're mm -hmm. not equity starving, or put it, putting it more succinctly, they're in league with the fraudsters. And uh, the appeals to general justice don't seem very well founded. Well, I mean, if that's, a, if that's the trump card that's going to be played, which I anticipate it will be um, in the next two hours, uh, and if that's the answer to it, then, then that's the answer to it. My, in my submission, that wouldn't be a principled approach to, to analysing and distinguishing Sun Life at all. No. Well, um, just um, like my Lord, Lord Justice Mills, taking up points um, uh, about general justice, um, but it, my, my lord, it's what, 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 um, uh, I'm getting a bit concerned about time. Oh. Um, we we have been, I think, at least until the last few minutes, remarkably restrained in the number of questions we've asked. You originally said the course would take two hours to cover. Um, how, how how far are we from from the the end of the? I would have thought twenty run? minutes or so. Right, we'll let you get on then. Yes. Um, can, I just, can I just say, at the risk of using the word justice again, uh, that what we're talking about here is procedural justice. Yeah. We're not talking about um, the merits uh, and the morality of the wider dispute. Good. Uh, that's, and that's what I take um, Lord Justice Mance to mean when he takes based on general justice. Uh, and it's, this is all about procedural justice. The phrase used in Ward and Savile was procedural justice and natural justice. They are both talking about the same thing, procedural justice. And then the final um, factor from Lord Justice Mance is in paragraph 68. And it's to do with the distinction between arbitration and litigation, um, principally around joinder, consolidation, confidentiality, and privacy. Now, we say that doesn't apply in a case. Um, it doesn't apply, as it happens, in LCIA arbitrations because of the joinder provision. Um, because, like I say, it would have been possible for Vale to join not just its co-claimant, Vale International, but any number of these defendants, um, and the tribunal could have ruled on that and joined them and, and bound them in. If, um, I know it said that that's fanciful, but it's possible. So, well, um, which version of the LCI rules apply to the arbitration? And if this is a point that matters, can we have a copy? Yeah, um, you can indeed. There's a footnote in the supplemental skeleton that makes that clear. I think it was the it's either it's the 2014 version. Um, but there's been a provision since '98, and it's basically always it's jumped around in its subnumbering, but it's always said the same thing. So the tribunal has a power to join any party if either the party consents or the, the arbitrating party seeking their joinder asks for it. And then it's, then it's a matter of discretion. So it could have happened. So that meets the joinder point. Um, perhaps more importantly, we get into privacy and confidentiality. So these, these are all said to feed into the overall rationale for why a stranger can't take the benefit of an award. But of course, that's all been blown apart in our case because this claimant or these claimants have come to court they have invoked and pleaded the award. They've invoked the rescission decree in the award. And they have sought um, the opening up of the arbitral process in order to make their claims good. So 
though I don't think they can invoke um, confidentiality and privacy. And like I say, joinder is subject to those rules. Very quickly then, Lord Justice Longmore recognising in paragraph 71 that this is over to because of, the, because of the outcome on issue three, gives his five reasons, starting in um, paragraph 73, the first of which is privacy and access to the award. You see that in the fifth line. There's considerable difficulty in simply producing an award. Arbitrations are usually private, etc. So his first reason is the privacy reason and the accessibility reason, again, doesn't apply here because this claimant has come to court and invoked the award and disclosed the award. The second reason or second difficulty is paragraph 75. Um, which we say doesn't apply to a decree of equitable um, rescission. A coverage dispute about whether a book of business did or didn't form part of a reinsurance treaty is completely different legally from a decree of equitable rescission, which, um, which extinguishes for all time on a retrospective basis um, any the particular contract, uh, which is the subject of it. The third reason in 77, although his lordship didn't say it thirdly, is the long-established principle that estoppels are mutual. You have my submission on that. And then the fourth reason given in paragraph 78 doesn't, doesn't apply in, um, in our particular case. I'll see what's made of that. Uh, the 82 of Lord Justice Longmore is, in a sense, the, um, the fortuity point, which is that actually stepping back from it, could you could you say could it actually be said that it was a point in the first arbitration in favour or against Sun Phoenix? Um, that doesn't apply in our case because the denial of personal restitutionary liability on the part of BSGR is unequivocally a point against Varley. And then Lord Justice Jacob um, just says gives his reasons in paragraph eighty seven. A is the essentially private matter. Um, being arbitration doesn't apply here for the reasons that I've given. B starts out by talking about the arbitration as a private matter. doesn't apply here because of the reasons that I've given. And there's a reference over the page to the happenstance. He says, a third party's rights against one of the parties to an earlier arbitration cannot depend on the happenstance of the availability of the details of that arbitration. But um, my lords, that rationale just cannot apply in a case where a claimant starts litigation by pleading his award. So the principle applies. The particular rationale in a particular case for the principle may not apply. Well, it, but but you, are you saying that the principle is subject to a series of caveats? Yes, I am. So long as you can get into one of those caveats, and those caveats are actually the five reasons. I'm saying it's... The nine I'm, reasons, depending on how you count them. I am saying, just to be clear, that the, um, this, the issue, the principle that we're talking about here does not apply where a party... Um, a, in, our, in this model, A, starts litigation, pleads the award, mm -hmm. invokes the award, and, in, and, and in, this is the particular point, invokes it for the decree of rescission yeah. in the award. And the icing on the cake then gets the court to allow him to disclose and open up the entire arbitral process, including the award, against non-parties. Once a claimant's done that, he's waived, effectively, he's destroyed confidentiality. That's gone. And because of the, the juridical nature of the decree of um, equitable decision, which is like nothing else, you have your mutuality. So there is, our case is not Sun Life. It's very far from Sun Life, and this court should say so. Sun Life is, is not a shutout. And if the, court, and if the principle needs qualifying more broadly around the <coughs> benefit-burden distinction, then this court should say that too in light of Ward and Savile, but I don't need to go that far. Um, Overview of my analysis. Can we turn, please, to the judgment? Unless I'd probably be ten minutes from here. That's fine. Keep going. The judgment is tab nine of the call. If we can pick it up, please, at paragraph nineteen. Because we say that, and this is in the grounds of appeal, that the learned judge erred in saying what he said in paragraph 19. It's not obvious how the classification by the arbitrators of the legal basis for their monetary could affect the creation of a rescission trust. 
Um, we, say, um, we say the opposite. It is obvious how that classification can affect the creation of a rescission trust um, with, with the greatest of respect. And that tends to suggest that the learned judge has then gone off um, down the wrong avenue. And I don't need to repeat why we say that is elementary and obvious. You then get Mr. Stanley's um, legal act submission rehearsed in paragraph 20. I think it was said in a rather intemperate letter from my learned friend's solicitors last week that the reference to a legal act in my supplemental skeleton was a, was a novel proposition that hadn't featured in the case earlier. But here you have it summarised as Mr. Stanley's core submission by reference to the decree of divorce. And then you get to the, where we say that the learned judge erred um, in 21. Because he says um, he doesn't have to get into any of the difficult stuff to do with the rescission equities and any of the substantive law that I've addressed my lords on today because there's in fact a clear, there's a split. There's a split in 21 Roman 1 between the legal fact of rescission and one of its consequences in law. We say that is wrong as a matter of law. See Lord Wright and Spence and Crawford and the other authorities. The, um, the existence or non-existence of personal restitutionary liability is a quid pro quo or precondition to the grant of a decree of equitable rescission, not a legally distinct consequence of it. But the problem here is the judge has brought an axe down, or rather he's drawn his ring fence in a, a more narrow. He's drawn a very narrow circle around rescission per se. Everything else is on the outside. It's all obiter, if you like. And therefore, um, you don't have to get into any of the, of the grisly stuff. And he doesn't. He avoids all that. Uh, you will see in Roman 3 a reference to Ms. Tulaney's submission that rescission is all or nothing, and any rescission trust operates by operation of law. Um, so what, if I can say that respectfully, to both the judge and my learned friend? We, we readily accept that a rescission trust, if it arises, arises by operation of law. That's merely descriptive of all constructive trusts. That's what the word constructive is doing in the phrase constructive trust. And the fact that rescission is all or nothing is uh, neither here nor there, if I can put it like that. Um, we're not talking about pro tanto or partial rescission of a contract. Uh, the contract was rescinded on the basis that there was no personal restitutionary liability. That is, that's the, um, that is the decree inside the ring fence. Um, 22 is interesting, if I can just spend a, a couple of minutes on it. There's the, obviously the dispute about the concession. Mr. Stanley's skeleton argument had asserted that it's for the tribunal, or for any court or tribunal, being asked to decree equitable rescission, quote, to decide how far and on what terms. It is said that that submission was withdrawn. I have, I have scoured the transcripts of this hearing that took place remotely below, and it is not there. Well, then a friend might seek to persuade you that that was conceded, but it wasn't. Now, is that material? No, it's not. Uh, because, because the learned judge actually bases his decision in 23 on Ms. Tulaney's submissions, not on the concession. But, at, um, but it's concerning that the learned judge short-circuited his reasoning by reference to what he perceived to be that concession when it wasn't made. Um, given the pressing uh, time limit, I'm going to ask my lords to note against 22 Roman 1 the fact that what, what you see quoted in that paragraph in italics is taken from four separate paragraphs of it looks like my Lord, Lord Justice Lewis has done the work uh, four separate paragraphs in the um, claimant's skeleton below the quote from El Adieu is in 22E this is all in the supplemental um, bundle the, the next phrase, the last point down to principle and practice comes from 23 the in principle bit comes from 24 and the in practice bit comes from 27. What you find when you read those paragraphs of the skeleton below is that they make the same fundamental error that the respondent skeleton makes on this in the appeal, which is that they, as they elide the exigibility, the exigibility of a personal and ergo proprietary restitutionary liability on the part of B with the need to prove to plead and prove it. You see repeated references, and I gave you them in the footnote in the su supplemental skeleton. There are repeated references throughout the claimant, the um, respondent's skeleton, in this call to the need to plead and prove. It's got nothing to do with the need to plead and prove. It just has to be exigible. It has to still exist. 
And our point is it was cut off at the roots, which means it never existed. It never can exist. And the whole idea that you have to plead and prove and win on it is just nothing to do with it. That's a vice. It's an analytical vice that permeates the whole of that skeleton and the skeleton below, and which the learned judge regrettably uh, swallowed hook, line, and sinker in his paragraph 22, small 1, where he basically cut and pasted bits from four separate paragraphs. It's all in there. Unfortunately, that vice therefore infects the judgment. The judgment is wrong. And then you see the, the, the core, um, effectively the ratio on this point in 23, which is all about res judicata. The judge didn't have cited to him, um, obviously, son life. And that was brought to my learned friend's attention by this court um, Friday. And now the debate is more around that. But it's a very narrow ratio. The learned judge below, and he produced this judgment with um, commendable speed before the Christmas vacation. I think the draft judgment came out within five days or so, and then was handed down on the, uh, later in the week, uh, ending on the 18th, the last day of term. He's to be commended for that, but he fell into error. He fell into error by short-circuiting um, his reasoning and going, going for the, the killer point, as it were, which advocates do, but I'm afraid judges sometimes uh, go wrong when they do. Uh, and that is that. Um, I'll say no more because my, my lords have my full submissions on ground one. Yes. Ground two, I'll, you also have my very full submissions on, and I've, I've dipped into it already. We say it is elementary and fundamental in English law that the rescission equity, that inchoate equity, is only held by and could only belong to A, the contracting party who is the, who is the misrepresentee. The representee. Um, the idea that someone else who pays money to B on behalf of A uh, gains, thereby gains a rescission equity or any other equity um, is heretical. There's nothing to suggest that that is possible. And we would say uh, there is plenty to suggest that it is undesirable because once you start splitting the equity, or um, multiplying the equity into the hands of more than just the contracting party, you just you just end up in a messy situation. It is called, albeit forensically, a rescission equity for good reason. It is the equity to rescind the contract. It belongs to one person only in a bilateral contract, the person who's been induced to enter into it, and only him. There is no separate species of equity that belongs to other people who got involved in the contract. And this all flows, this idea of splitting the equity to give, some, to give a separate, distinct equity to, to Vale International, so it can then bring its own separate um, proprietary claim against these defendants, is all a device to get round a bad result on this point in the award. And that, that bad result for Vale on this point in the award flowed, from what I can tell, from some bad decision-making by its legal team, because they never ran the agency for and should my clients, for all the moral judgments anyone wants to make about them for today's purposes, should my clients be fixed with a proprietary claim or the potentiality of a proprietary claim in circumstances where it all flows from what some lawyers didn't do properly in an arbitration over the course of five years for which they charged $20 million in legal fees? In my submission, the answer to that is obvious. Whose fault was it that it took five years? That I don't know. I wasn't involved. Um, my Lord, the answer to splitting the equity is said to be case management by reference to the Supreme Court decision in Marek. And we've touched on this already. In my submission, there certainly isn't any precedent for it. And in my submission, um, it just isn't workable at all in practice to have B, in my model, B, fixed with proprietary liability to um, A1, Vale, sorry, personal liability to A1, Vale, and this is in a different world where this has been not been precluded. So B has a personal restitutionary liability to A1 and has a proprietary restitutionary liability to A2. How on earth do you case management the relationship between those and avoid the hazard of accumulation of remedies? Um, I say it's impossible. I say the fact that Molina Friend has resorted to that suggestion to meet the problems created by splitting of the equity 
tells you an awful lot about what is wrong with the, the idea of splitting the equity in the first place. If you do split the equity, you will be making new law. There is no, I'm, I've not seen any suggestion, even in the academic writings, and they do like to suggest that you can split the equity as suggested, but I'll wait to see quite how that is developed. My lords, I've gone longer than I planned, and I've gone past one o'clock, and I apologize, but those are my submissions in support of the appeal. Thank you very much. Um, we'll resume at five past two.